Good like we're good. We're good to go. We're live, Lou. So welcome to anyone who is watching us on Facebook, LinkedIn, or my YouTube channel. My name is Renata Bernardi. I am a podcast host. I host the Job Hunting Podcast. This interview will become an episode of the Job Hunting Podcast in a few weeks. And I love doing it live because it allows anyone who is out there job hunting and browsing through LinkedIn to come along and interview my guests and ask them questions as well if they feel like it. Today, I have the wonderful Lou Adler. Lou, you don't know this, but you have been on my wish list as a guest mm. for my podcast since I started this. I've always admired your work, well, thank your you. pro. You're prolific on, on LinkedIn, and I have followed you uh, consistently for the past many years, and you have really influenced my coaching. So I'm really excited to have you here as a guest today. Thank yeah, you thank for you accepting. <laughs> thank you. So I, I am assuming a lot of people know uh, Lou Adler, but if you don't, I'm going to read very quickly his bio. He's the CEO and founder of Performance-Based Hiring Learning Systems, which is a consulting and training firm that helps recruiters and hiring managers to source, interview, and hire the best candidates out there. He's also the author of amazing books, and if you haven't read it, please consider buying one of them, uh, Hire With Your Head, The Essential Guide to Hiring and Getting Hired, and, um, you know, he's always on LinkedIn. Sorry, there's another book, LinkedIn's Learning Performance-Based Hiring Video Training Program. I don't know much about that one, but you can talk to us about that one, Lou. Um, and I have the latest edition of Hiring With Your Head. So I would recommend that one if you want to start Good. somewhere. Good recommendation. Good recommendation. <laughs> Lou, you've had an amazing career and you're an influencer in your, um, you know, industry with recruiters and employers looking for you to you for advice and support um, in this sort of talent war. Tell me what led you to work in this area? What has inspired you to do this type of work? Well, I wasn't inspired to do it, so I won't go that way, but I I will say that I used to work for a living, and this was back when I was young, many, many years ago, probably 45 years ago. I was running a manufacturing company, uh, th early 30s, and I had a boss who the group president who was a micromanager. And every day, I, he came by every two weeks to my manufacturing facility, and which had about 300 people in it, so it was not insignificant, but... And he and I just yelled and screamed at each other, but I didn't want him around. I tried to lock him out and he still kept on coming in. So I just quit four times in one year. I started using recruiters. Oh boy. And I realized that re at least the recruiters I was using actually had a better life than I did. I was working 60, 70, 80 hours a week and these guys are working 30 or 40 or 50. And I said, yeah, I think I might try that. And my wife supported it. I'm still married to the same woman, so it's been many, many years. But that was a big uh -huh. deal to start to quit a job where I was running a company, and then became a recruiter. But I can't say I was inspired to do it. I did it because I didn't like to. So I was going to look for another job if it didn't work out. Yeah. But I realized that in most cases hiring was was super done. It was a dumb thing the way people hired people, the way candidates got jobs, the way companies hired people. It was not a business process. So I said, you know, this is actually, I could do pretty well in this if I just kind of look at it as a business process. If people aren't seeing the right candidates, you don't show more candidates. You figure out why. If candidates aren't doing a good job of interviewing and if they're good people, then you got to change the way the interview. You, uh, you look at all the pieces, it was a bunch of hodgepodge of odds and ends, and nobody knew what they were doing. Uh, and they still don't. So I just said, okay, I think by, if everybody does it right, the recruiter, the hiring manager, the HR department, the candidate, and how everybody made decisions, you actually could create a blueprint for hiring great people and where it was called a win-win situation, where the candidate was excited about the job, not only on the start date, but also throughout the year and actually a couple of years he was, she was there, and the hiring manager was happy to have the person. Uh, 
so that was the, and I won't even say it was a goal. It was selfish as, hey, if I could do it right, I'd make more placements and make more money. So it, it wasn't really altruistic. It was, hey, I think I could pull this off. And I think we did. Wrote a bunch of books and started, and it turned out I, I'm doing a new course with LinkedIn, which is what you mentioned, which I'm yes. going to the studio in uh, oh, December. But they asked me to come up with a, a quick reason uh, or a quick problem we're solving. And it's the same problem that every everyone was solving is how do you kind of make sure that the candidate and the hiring manager make the right decision? So in mm. some way that is the inspiration now because I'm 76 and semi-retired. So I work when I want to work, but, um, but so that's probably the inspiration. So sorry for the long story, Renata, but that's no, that's a great story. Cool. One of the things that I've always loved about your, uh, your teaching and your posts on LinkedIn is how visual they are. And I can see what you've just uh, told you know that that's the way you think you're trying to find the protocols and the the roadmaps playbooks you know you're always posting you're writing but you're always showing people what it looks like in a visual way and I find that that's really you know what captured me in the first place to pay more attention to you do you see that as a strength of yours to kind of yeah, show people well, the, the the process well part of it so I don't know. That's actually an interesting point. I don't know what came first, but mm -hmm. I knew that if I could tell a story with words, with pictures, it would be easier to understand. So I don't know that it was a thing that I wanted to do. It just happened because, okay, and some, some articles said you can only put 600 words together to write an article. Yes. Said, well, how am I going to do that uh, without a graphic? So I think it was more that it happened. So then I just kind of went with it as a result yeah. of that. So I don't know that it was, oh yeah, I can't wait to do a graphic. It happened and I think I was forced to do it. And then I just, hey, I'm telling stories and some industrial training said, hey, Lou, tell more, show more pictures. So I think it happened that way. As a, and I think I had a boss when I got into recruiting, I was very visual. So I said, oh, that's cool. We'll try that graphic and that graphic, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't know the real answer, the underlying answer to that, but it's a good question. No, that that I think that has always helped me. One of the, one of the other things too that I've uh, noticed in your writing, and you you focus on it over and over again, is your. Can I? I'm going to put words in your mouth, but you can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, your dislike for behavioral questions, which I. <laughs> that's maybe I'm saying too much. I dislike them, <laughs> and that performance based question that you. Um, uh, recommend and, and and teach people how to use it's so much better as a selection tool in my view and I'd love you to um, expand on how you came up with that when did you realize that there was something wrong with the questioning and during an interview process well first off you get dumb questions which are hey what what animal are you and uh, you know do you like Seattle over uh, <laughs> Brazil or something, whatever. It was just a stupid yeah. question. So there's that whole mm -hmm. host of questions. Behavioral questions a little more structured, which is, hey, give me an example of when you've been results oriented. Mm -hmm. uh, my whole focus, just to give people on the background, and I'll get into how a candidate can do a better job of answering questions, uh, is, hey, you know, we need to launch a new product line, Renata. Can you walk me through how you built that up and how, if you've ever done that? So then I would peel the onion. Yeah. So as we started getting credible with big clients, because I've been doing this for so many years, uh, people pushed back and said, that's not a behavioral question. Mm -hmm. So then I started doing research on behavioral questions and actually did, read a lot of stuff on uh, the, the validity of a behavioral interview, which is giving a, getting an example of a person and spent two or three minutes understanding it. Yeah. The, the idea behind it, and I'll bring both of those ideas together. That's actually not a bad question if the interviewer has done a job analysis ahead of time. You have to understand exactly how that behavior competency has worked. Mm -hmm. And it, the research says it does work if you do the job analysis. It, but it all, the research also says it doesn't work at all if you don't do the job analysis. But what's happened is, is that all these people in HR and all these people who use it Forget the part of you got to understand the job to make the question valid. 
So, so that's one idea of why I don't like it. If you don't do a job analysis, behavioral questions are flawed fundamentally and they're useless. They're just as bad as stupid questions. Well, not mm -hmm. as bad as stupid, almost as bad as stupid questions. Uh, the approach that I use is called behavioral fact finding. So when I ask you, Renata, hey, we got to launch a new product worldwide in the next nine months. It's under a very tight budget and we got very limited restraints from an advertising standpoint. If you were to get this job, Tell us about, tell me about something you've done that's most related to that. I would then spend 15 or 20 minutes getting behavioral fact finding questions and understand that. Hey, where'd you organize a team to do that? Where did you face a challenge that you had to overcome that? Where did you uh, find most satisfying? Where'd you take the initiative? So I would ask behavioral fact finding and I put them under the umbrella of an accomplishment. It turns out when you read the research, and there's been a lot of research on it, that is the correct way to ask a behavioral question. Not just asking generally one competency and get a two-minute example. It's really understand it. So what we do is we ask, we, I spend a lot of time digging into a candidate's accomplishments and looking at the trend of those accomplishments and understand what behaviors that candidate used to achieve the results. And then I look at how those behaviors changed over time. I know that sounds kind of researchy and HR uh, logic, and I just fell into it. It was because I'm an engineer and you kind of figure out, hey, how do things work? Why did this work? And you, you kind of try things. You do this. I've interviewed thousands and thousands and thousands of people. I didn't mm. come up with that first. I just figured out, hey, how am I going to figure out? So I started getting better and better and better in asking these questions. And then I talked to, as people started saying, hey, this stuff actually works. I had to talk to PhDs. I had to talk to uh, psychologists. I had to talk to lawyers. And then they looked at it and said, oh, Adler stuff actually works. But yeah. it was almost like, I was doing these testing going on and I tried a different kind of uh, example or tests of trying to experiments. And I found the experiments that worked. I said, okay, I've been tracking people's careers for five, 10 years. And I know when I asked that question three years ago, this is what happened and here's how I answered it. So I think it's a little bit unusual, but it's this, it's this live laboratory of interviewing people and understanding their performance that has taken place over five or 10 or 15 or 20 years. I'm sorry again for that long answer, but. Um, no, that's perfect. You know, when, when I um, when I found out about you and I read that article that you reposted today about the, the most important question, um, I read it. I, I was trying to remember when I first read it. I think it was 2016, 17, as I was preparing for another job and I was also coaching people already at that time. And um, I, what I felt as somebody who has been a candidate many times and had to go through a lot of interviews, it, it's just the way that the question is, um, uh, the way that you ask that question makes the candidate feel more comfortable with themselves and with their experience. Whereas when you know you're getting a behavioral type question, tell me about it. It, it, it just immediately makes the candidate worry about that star format and the framing of it. Yeah. And it becomes more of an issue that the formatting of how you answer the question is more of an issue than the content of, you know, your experience yeah, right. and what you're trying to convey. So it's really confusing, especially because, um, professionals are not always job hunting. So they don't get to get good at answering questions. They get to get good at doing their job. So if you're asking a question about their jobs and when they performed really well at their jobs in a way that's really natural, it sounds natural, the answer comes also in a more natural way. That's mm -hmm. what I really liked about that post and those extended questions, you know, the, how you expand on that first question. I thought, wow, this, is, this would make me feel really comfortable with a recruiter if it was asked in that format. It also makes you feel, and I tell uh, hiring managers and recruiters all the time, is that there's more to an interview than just assessing competency. You also yes. want to recruit the candidate because if the candidate's any good, that person's going to use the quality of your interview to say, I want to work for that person. And if your yes. interview is respectful and understanding and they leave, and they well, that person really dug deep into my background and really understands what I'm capable of doing and I want to work for that person. Uh, yeah. But I also tell candidates, and I tell this because I've interviewed thousands and thousands of candidates, I tell them, candidate, if I represent you, there's a good chance you're going to get the offer because I don't send a lot of candidates in. So there's probably 25 to 35 percent chance you'll get an offer. But you better do a good job of interviewing. Uh, so I'm going to prep you on how to interview well. 
And I said, I quite frankly, I couldn't care if you're a crappy interviewer or not. It doesn't bother me at all. You got to be a better, good person. If I think you're a good person and can do this work, I'm going to make you a, at least a good enough interviewer or that won't be the issue. Uh, so I tell candidates alike, if you do a great job in the interview, don't feel so great about yourself because it just means you're a good presenter. And if you do a crappy job of interviewing, don't feel too bad. It just means you're a crappy interviewer. It doesn't have anything to do with you're good or bad on the job. I said, yeah. so we created a class. And if you go to winwinhiring.com, I charge people five bucks because that's what I got to pay the uh, people. It's a 30 day class on how to prep for an interview. Oh, uh, right. But it's important for candidates uh, to take control of the interview. And one thing I, and I'm having a book club meeting on the day after tomorrow. Uh, and it's for candidates. And I tell candidates, if you're in an interview and ask somebody asks you a stupid question or it's unclear, just to say, if they ask you a behavioral question, uh, mm -hmm. like, hey, tell me about when you're results oriented, you might just want to push back a little bit and say, hey, hiring manager, interviewer, where in this area is it most critical for this job to be results oriented? Because I'd like to give you a story or an example of work that I've done that's related to the job. So pushing back and asking for clarity around the question, number one, brands you as somebody who's different than typical candidate. You're going to, because you're a little pushy, not too pushy, but pushy enough. Uh, the fact that you have the confidence to ask the question says, wow, this person's kind of confident. As important is getting the answer. You have to give an yeah. example of that's related to the job. So you'll understand by saying, hey, how is that related to the job? Or can you clarify what this job really requires? And you give an example of that work. You're now focusing on your ability to do that work related to the job. So you'll just, you're, just the question alone will put you in the top half of all the candidates. If you answer it properly, yeah. you'll get an, well, you'll be in the top 25% of all candidates. So, and again, I've prepped literally, I've probably been involved. I've interviewed probably 10,000 candidates over 40 years. So it's not that many per year when you think about yeah. it. It's a lot of years. But I prepped a lot. And I and then I call hiring managers up, the interviewer up right after that. What do you think of the candidate? And they had the candidate call me. So I kind of get this instant feedback of how different reactions are. Again, mm -hmm. because I've been in this ex conducting this experiment in real time for so many years, it's not this human insight. It's just, hey, if you do an experiment 50, 50 times or 100 times or 500 times, you start seeing what works and what doesn't work. Uh, so I think though the issue that I see is a candidate asking for clarity around a job. Hey, Renata, could you tell me a little bit about what this job's all about or some of the challenges? I'd like to give you examples of work that are most related to what you need done. That's just yeah. a game changer. You've now yeah. focused on the real work and you have an opportunity to uh, give examples of work you've done that are most related. Yeah. Uh, Lou, what would you suggest a candidate do when a question is asked that is that the candidate perceived as being incredibly biased? So, you know, I had a, a couple of clients recently, both in the US and in Australia, that were asked questions that made me worry as their coach. Um, I'll give you an example. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. A, a new, um, not, not new, you know, she's been in Australia for about five years. But one of the first questions that she got on the panel was, you know, has it been difficult adapting to working in Australia? And, and she immediately thought, you know, that they had already a bias towards the fact that she doesn't have strong experience in Australia, that she has worked overseas and they were concerned about, you know, we, she didn't get the job in the end. And okay, I think so one of the reasons it. for is that she she is fairly new to the job market here. Well, I think so. Again, let's be proactive as your candidate. So you asked me a question that maybe I'm a little old. Uh, mm. just, let's assume it. I am a little old, so I don't want, mm -hmm. but I'm a lot old, so let's not get into it. But irrespective, mm -hmm. if you have a sense of any question, just, hey, Renata, so let's take this example. Mm -hmm. I understand I haven't been in the Australian market very long in working here, but I've been in a lot of different markets uh, where I've had an opportunity to adapt to the circumstances. Would you mind giving me an example of where you feel that that would be a great concern in this job, not understanding how the Australian marketplace or working cross-functionally might work? Mm -hmm. So now, the, now you push the question back. Yes. Now they got to expose their bias. Um, I love that. 
And again, there was a, a situation, and it had to be real long ago, but so I'm not positive. The guy was very soft spoken, candid, very soft spoken. And I said, you got to ask more questions because my goal was to pursue. And he just said, I understand this is a pretty, and he was a very soft spoken. I understand this is a very challenging environment uh, and cross functional working with manufacturing. And he said it calmly, a little. Uh, mm -hmm. not, and he said, can you give me some examples of how being able to uh, coordinate different cross-functional teams of different varieties and different levels will be critical to success on the job? Because I'd like to give you an example of work that I've done that I think are related to that. So he was in a very soft-spoken manner. Mm -hmm. He just pushed back and I kind of told him he had to ask a question because he was soft-spoken, but I knew he was good. I knew he could answer the question. He just had to be asked the question. So in this case, right. he didn't wait for the question to be asked. He asked the question. Right. So in your case, you knew that this candidate was going to have that problem because they didn't have much work. So they have, rather than wait for the question to be asked, proactively intervene. So now it says, hey, I'm going to deal with your bias right away. Um, yes. Now let's assume you have a weak accent or tough accent. And you could, and you could, as and you say in some accent is, you know, I understand that communicating with different kinds of people at different levels, professionals and uh, customers will be critical for this job. And this person's got a bad, a weak accent. And they know they do. They said, yes. can you give me examples of how that might be on the job? I'd like to address that. And I'm sure that will be a concern for you. So you mm -hmm. raise the concern by asking a question and then you answer. Now, obviously, if you can't answer it properly, you are not going to get the job. But by addressing it, you put it in the park. You don't put it in the parking lot. But, hey, you know that you have these issues. Hey, I'm an yes. old guy. I know that you're going to feel uncomfortable with my old, but I'm pretty energetic and I can still get the job done. But you've got to raise the issue. So I'd say you got to be proactive and not wait for it to happen. And hopefully I don't ask it, you know, put get in your face and ask the question. So that's how the advice I would give to people. Lou, you know what I love about this discussion and your answer is up until now, whenever I have the situation with a client, I tell them to listen to an episode of a podcast that's not mine. <laughs> uh, it's Zeth Godin, and he's talking about what we he calls, he has a fancy word for it, like meta discourse. But it's basically what you're saying is addressing the elephant in the room and taking control over the narrative and, you know, telling people that you can do the job yep, despite or, okay. or because of whatever it is that they've identified in you. And that has been part of my coaching. And, ne and now instead of sending people to see somebody else's podcast, I can say, just listen to my conversation right. with Lou. Yeah. <laughs> so idea. I'm really Good excited idea. about that. Thank you so much. Um, but, you know, most recently now, uh, just to give you an idea about uh, how the job hunting podcasts have grown, I started it in October, Halloween day of October 2019. So just before the pandemic hit. And I will tell you what I did. I pre-recorded lots of episodes, right? And I said, oh, this is going to be fantastic. I'm going to be able to say to people a whole bunch of things I've always wanted to say and teach people how to job hunt. Um, and then the pandemic hit and the episodes just didn't make sense anymore. Yeah. I feel like now I have to always reflect what's happening in the job market at that point in time, because there was a time, as you remember, there were no jobs. All of a sudden there were lots of jobs and then people were resigning and now people are quite quitting. Like there's always something going on and there's I have to address. Yeah. I wonder if you could share with us, you know, because you have such amazing experience, what have you noticed in the past three years that have fundamentally changed in recruitment and selection of candidates, if anything, or maybe I'm just overstating it? No, no, I think, um, well, let's go up to 19 or 2019. Human nature didn't change. Mm -hmm. uh, Darwin's theory didn't change. The evolution still existed. Uh, people said people, the younger people are lazy. I said, no, they're not. They just got crappy jobs. So, uh, <laughs> but and I think what what changed about 30 years ago is job boards. Before job boards, it was hard to change. It wasn't hard. You had to really work to change jobs. So if you had a job, you didn't just apply and hope you got another interview the next day. So people stayed with companies longer, in many cases, longer than they should, uh, because it was hard to change jobs and interviewing again didn't relate to your ability. So it was hard, and you kind of had to be committed to change jobs. So I think over the last, up till 2019, people changed jobs uh, 
because it was easy. I just apply to another job. And if you're good, you'll get an interview and you'll go out and you'll visit and in a week or so over two weeks, you could find another job. So I think that, and then people said, well, people are lazy. No, they just, uh, people looked at a job as not as important. It was very transactional. I'll just buy it for my, you buy me per time. They pay me as much as you can and I'll be kind of happy or not happy. And then if that doesn't work, I'll get another job. So I think we've made job changings a superficial thing. So now let's go to 2019. I don't think that thing has changed about jobs, but I think the idea of work has fundamentally changed. I, this, I truly believe that uh, because of working at home and part-time work, that has fundamentally changed how work will be done. You can't force people to come in, uh, but I think some work needs to be collaborative and in-person. Other times, it doesn't have to be a full-time. That yeah. has to evolve in how companies actually define and argue and organize work. And that puts a real burden on the hiring manager to coordinate all these little pieces. So that's a cultural issue that companies are going to have to deal with. Now, from a candidate interviewing standpoint of getting the job, it really means that video interviews like this are very, very critical. Very, mm -hmm. very critical. Uh, and I don't know that, you know, I talk about the accent. And the speed of talking, I talk very fast. I'm from New York, uh, so I talk fast and I recognize that. I mm -hmm. have to slow down um, when I, if I'm trying to sell my client, but I can't, so I just deal with it. If you can't deal with it, to be it, uh, so be it, I should say. So when I think candidates and how you interview, uh, that becomes very, very critical, is that you have to be able to ask the questions. You have to be able to get your personality in there, the length of your answers and all those things around being a good interviewer online and a good presenter online is very, very critical. Mm -hmm. um, and I think people, if I was just to give advice to a candidate without thinking deeply, I would start taking some, I would kind of put some training classes online and just develop them for yourself. So you learn how to communicate on to a group, whether you ever, put them on there, but I would kind of create, tell candidate, hey, tell stories online, video, uh, and then listen to them to make sure that you're making an effective program online. That would be a kind of a prep that I would probably yeah. help people do. Uh, the problem, I think, is when candidates accept offers and hiring managers give offers, they're now kind of thinking very short term. I got to get this person to do the job. They sound pretty good online. I'll take this job. I think there's another level of superficiality added to uh working and organizing work, which I don't think we fully understood. If I was going to hire somebody online, um, I'd really want to spend a little bit more time. It's very hard for me to hire somebody full time without knowing the person, meeting the person, having lunch or dinner with the person, uh, meeting in a little kind of a workshop session. I just would feel very uncomfortable, but you have to do it now. I've yes. done it one person and um, and I didn't feel, I mean, it's, I've had a meter now a number of times in person, but I was quite uncomfortable doing it uh, before I actually met her in person. I had a feeling yes. it wasn't going to work and I was probably right, but I needed to do it anyway. And nonetheless, it, there was a lot more risk associated with it on both sides. Yes. Although I, I interviewed um, uh, a dean of a university here during the pandemic and I'll put a link in the show notes for those listening later. And Nick was telling me he works for the top university in Australia, Australian National University. And he had hired three people uh, during the pandemic that were still overseas, unable to move to Australia because the country was completely shut down. I don't know if you know much about how Australia managed uh, the COVID-19 situation, but we, we shut down. There were no flights mm. to Australia. And um, that, that was just amazing to see people hiring at that very senior academic level, mm. not being able to come to work in mm. the country that they are now uh, being hired to work and and doing all that selection process um, remotely. Whereas in the past, universities would spend quite a lot of money scouting academics overseas, especially in Australia, because we want to grow our um relevance in, in mm -hmm. university uh, rankings. So you would try to hire people and go overseas and scout and spend quite a lot of money doing so. Um, so things have changed a lot. One thing that I've noticed as well, because my my clients are usually 40 plus, um, 
middle managers and up, you know, up to sea level. And uh, right during the pandemic, it went from face to face networking to get a CEO their next job to all of a sudden a straight to camera interview. You have five minutes to answer three questions. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're the and one. and that is a true story. You know, it was a, a hospital CEO role. And of course, uh, the client was not prepared for it. And and up until, you know, a few months before, that sort of uh, technology was being used to hire graduates and junior staff for, you know, large organizations like banks, you know, you wouldn't have used that technology to hire C-level uh, executives. So wh what have you, I mean, what is your view on that? And how do you train recruiters and, and candidates to deal with that level of technology? Well, again, I'll, I'll go back to the core level. Mm. If you don't know how to answer a question, it doesn't matter what technology you use. Uh, and I'll say ask and answer questions to make sure you're inter being interviewed properly. Once you get that down, then the technology just becomes an enabler of asking the questions. But if you don't know how to ask and answer questions and the interviewer doesn't know how to ask and answer questions, then you're focusing more on the presentation of the candidate and the technology then becomes a complicator. Oh God, because now you're already nervous and now you're doubly yeah. nervous because you're asking, you got this technology piece that intercedes that kind of messes you up. So when I go back, so I've always suggested 30 years ago, maybe it was even 40 years ago, I said the one, the best way to eliminate interviewer bias is conduct a phone screen for 30 minutes before you ever meet the person in person. This was before Zoom. And I, people wouldn't even have a phone call. Uh, but it was, if I just have a phone call, hey, I'm going to ask you a few questions, Renata. And I always had my hiring managers do it. So if I had a candidate, Renata, I really like this person. Would you have a phone screen before we organize it? So I would actually mm -hmm. tell you what to ask as a hiring manager. And I kind of say, hey, just dig deep into this person's accomplishments. I feel that they're related to the job that we've discussed. So I kind of controlled what the hiring manager would ask and I controlled what the candidate would answer. Uh, and they'd have a 30 minute call and you would then invite the candidate in for a full interview uh, on site. Mm -hmm. Now that burden was on you. Normally, if I was a recruiter to set the meeting up, you, the hiring manager, would think it's my fault that I interviewed the candidate. But in this case, you then invited the candidate up. So you took responsibility for doing a better job. Number one, I reduced bias because we're focused on accomplishments. Number two, you didn't blame me for interviewing the candidate. You blamed yourself for interviewing it. And you tended to not want to do it improperly. So you actually conducted a better interview. So the phone screen always became a powerful, powerful tool to increase assessment accuracy. And I told yes. candidates, whether I put you or not, is I would always demand a phone screen before you go on site. Don't waste your time going on site. Now, this was... 10 years ago before Zoom. Mm -hmm. It's hard to just have a phone call right now that's not video. So you kind of say, okay, that's going to yeah. happen. You just got to deal with it. It's going to be a video uh, phone screen. But if you really understand how to ask questions as a candidate, and the, yes. the way I say to answer, ask him is, hey, Renata, could you give me some examples of big projects or big challenges a candidate's going to face on the job? I'd like to give you examples of work that I've done that are most related. So that's kind of how you get the hiring manager. And even if you got to do that on video or not, you got to do it. Yeah. Um, I tell candidates to use what I call the SAFW response to talk two to three minutes for every single answer. SAFW mm. says say a few words. Make an opening statement. It just kind of highlights what you've done. Amplify it. I tell you over the last three to, you know, uh, I understand that working cross-functionally with manufacturing, engineering, and accounting is critical. Over the mm -hmm. last three to five years, I've worked a lot with different levels and different jobs related to that in this, this information. Then they, so it's SA is say a few examples, make a statement, amplify the statement, then give an example. Let me give you a specific example of where I did that, which happened a year and a half ago, Renata, where I had yeah. to, I, over, I was involved in a project where I was doing all of the engineering design work for this new system. Uh, and the area that I thought was interesting is, and you kind of give us some story about, hey, 
marketing wanted this, the finance people wanted this, and I came and I developed a way to bridge the gap between our cost function, the customer who wanted this, and we could optimize. And I feel very comfortable that I can work cross-functionally like that. That's an yes. example. Yes. And wrap it up. And I said, if those are the kinds of things that you've done here, I really feel that's my strength is to bring these different kind of parties together and understand what we're really trying to do and deliver good products to our customers. Uh, now, if you really understand how to ask questions that are relevant and answer questions that are relevant around your strengths and weaknesses, then it doesn't matter the vehicle in which you use to communicate. And that, I think, is at the core. And I, I really focus hiring managers and recruiters and candidates alike have to be good at presenting their information and asking it. And then the technology in which that's communicated becomes a secondary issue. But if you don't know either of the first two parts, the technology screws everybody up and you walk away and say, oh, I did a crappy telephone interview. No, you did a crappy interview because you weren't prepared to, regardless of the interview. So Yes. It's easy to blame the technology when, in fact, that there is that core that needs to be right. developed and I understood. I you agree. Like you know, things go screw up and you deal with it. I didn't know if I was going to get You didn't. You sent me this LinkedIn uh, yes. thing to here, and I realized, hey, how could I not have it? But, you know, you deal with it. <laughs> Uh, Lou, Lou uh, the win-win hiring system that you've developed and you teach, um, can you explain to candidates what it means? Because I think that uh, a lot of people will resonate with it, considering how important culture, culture in a good workplace has become for people that are changing jobs in 2022. Well, let me do it two ways. So let okay. me kind of, let's assume... You were you were not over my candidate for a job. Let's assume the marketing director of marketing. And I I might say, hey Renati, I really like your background. And this is in the first 20 minutes. I really like your background. Uh, I want to spend more time digging into it, but I want to set end this call today with this idea. If I actually, and I there's a lot of work to be done, but if I present you as a candidate. I'm only going to send three or four candidates. That's the deal I always have. So I've got to do my due diligence to make sure you're one of them. But if you're one of the candidates, you're going to be a 30 to 40% chance you'll get an offer. But I want to kind of set the stage here for you to think about how you're going to accept an offer. Three or four weeks from now, if we go forward, you're going to have probably three or four different interviews with different people. Uh, if you get an offer, three or four days before you actually get this offer, I'm going to call you up and say, Renata, Forget the money. Do you really want this job? Because if you don't want this job, we're not going to make you an offer. But I want you to tell me why you want this job without being the money biasing your judgment. And I expect you to tell me what I call what I, we in my company, we have what we call a win win hiring outcome. A win win hiring outcome means we ex, we measure success for you taking this job on the anniversary, your anniversary date, not the start date meaning a year from the day you start, let's assume it was December 1st. Next year, December 1st, I'm going to call you up, 2023, and I'm going to say, Hi, Renata, how's that job going? And you're going to say it was a great job. And I'm going to call the hiring manager up and say, how's Renata doing? And say, well, she's great. That's a positive win-win hiring outcome. But to get to that, the job has to be the right job for you. You have to be motivated to do that work. You have to see the growth and the opportunity that job represents as the right place. You have to see the culture as a place where you can thrive. I talked about the culture being the pace, how decisions are made, the quality of the hiring manager, how you're learning and developing, how that work-life balance works for you, your chance to make an impact. So there's a lot of variables we're going to get into that have nothing to do with the compensation or your benefits package. Yeah. Over the next two to three weeks, it is incumbent upon us and the company to get you all the information to make the right decision but it's incumbent upon you to gather that information and compare every other opportunity you have, not on the compensation package, but on the work itself, the environment in which that work takes place. And if you're motivated to do that work, because I don't want you to kind of say, I, they promised me all this and it isn't the job I wanted. No, we're going to get it there. We're going to tell you exactly the challenges that you have in this job and why they're motivating for you. We're going to ask questions about that. We're going to ask questions about the environment. That's what we call win-win hiring outcome, hiring for the anniversary date, not the start date. And it's incumbent upon the company, the hiring manager, the recruiter to get to give you that information. But it's incumbent upon you, the candidate and the candidate's advisors, friends, family, spouse to evaluate the biz, the career opportunity itself, not the size of the compensation package. And I know, mm -hmm. Renata, 
you're going to focus the day you get an offer, you'll have two or three offers. You're going to focus more on the biggest pay package. No, you got to focus on what's the biggest career package. And that's mm -hmm. hard to do, but I want to start to set the stage right now of why win-win hiring is so important in outcome. Lou, how, how do you balance that with um, this other concept that I've, I've read in one of your um, articles about not moving jobs without, if it's not for a raise of 30% or more? Of well, the your, 30%, uh, I'd say this. Yeah, so, I like that. Okay, so here's what I say, Renata, in my, and then you might want to say, what do you mean by how do I know if it's a big enough job? I said, I use what I call the 30% solution, Nada. Renata, we have to give you at least a 30% increase. But it's nothing to do with money. It's not okay. money. It's it's job impact. It could be a more important job. could be mm -hmm. a bigger job. It could be more learning, more growth, more satisfaction. Each of those pieces could be worth 5 or 10% better than what you're getting now or other jobs. Collectively, they have to be at least 30% better than what you're doing from the non-monetary standpoint. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the compensation has to be competitive, uh, so I don't want to minimize it. But, if we're, but once the compensation is competitive it becomes less important. So don't make it too important. It's got to be in the game. And I understand that. But if you get 30% non-monetary increase, you'll be making a heck of a lot more next year and a year after that. Yeah. So don't think about what you're getting on the start date. Think about what you're going to be getting next year and a year after that and a year after that. So if we put you on the biggest growth path, the money is going to be insignificant what you get today. We're talking uh, all the money you're going to get in the future. And growing faster, the best career, uh, not only will you get more money, but you'll have a heck of a lot more satisfaction and a better life. So do you think that a red flag for a lack of win-win strategy from a candidate's perspective would be, you know, focusing too much on the package? What would be the red flag for uh, the employer so that the candidate kind of sort of thinks, oh, maybe this is not the win-win employment for me? What would well, what would be a red flag during the recruitment process for the candidate? Well, let's say if I'm interviewing a candidate, I, yeah. During the work history review, I always say, hey, uh, Renata, tell me, uh, how would you change jobs? Why did you go from your current job to the one you just had? Uh, and you'll say, oh, I was for career opportunity and growth. I said, well, did you get that out of that job? Mm -hmm. They say, well, no, they promised me this and they promised me that. So everyone will say they took the job for career reasons, but the reality is they took it for the pay package. Well, I said, well, let's go back. Why did you go from job B to job C, which was only three years ago? Well, mm -hmm. I did it because career opportunity. What happened then? Mm -hmm. uh, they did it for, they promised me this, but didn't do that. And I said, Renata, you know, you're changing jobs. I know you say it's for career reasons, but you're not doing your due diligence. That's mm -hmm. really not the reality of what you might use those words and believe that. But the reality is you're taking it for the pay package. Now, I might, as a recruiter, I would say that to the candidate as a career coach. Yeah. And I think you, Renata, talking to your clients, you could see why they've changed jobs. I look at changing jobs as a strategic decision to improve growth. If two or three times you just change it for the money, you're really basically saying, no, I'm just out for the money because you're, mm -hmm. you're, you're kind of plateaued of where you are. You're not getting bigger jobs, bigger teams growing, taking on more important projects. So as a red flag for me is, hey, your growth is plateaued and you give me a lot of BS, which is American term for bullshit. Uh, yes. <laughs> or uh, and you can cut that out if you want. But uh, no, no, uh, it but I, know, I know if a candidate is serious or not. Uh, why mm -hmm. they take jobs. And they uh, and just like I think most people would say, when I told you I changed jobs because my boss was a micromanager, this was 44 years ago, people would believe that. I could go through it and I could tell you all the other jobs that I've had, but I had a pretty good growth path. And most people thought I was an idiot for doing it uh, to get leave a company where I was really growing and had a huge job. Uh, irrespective of that, the point is, by really understanding, you can't hide your... Uh, your growth, you can't hide your decisions. You might be able to think you can talk your way out of them. The reality is the progression shows. So to me, no progression, a lot of words and no action and a lot of job changes for superficial reasons is pretty clear. And that's the red flag I have when I'm interviewing a candidate. Yeah. Um, I, I also was, you know, I sent you this question ahead of um, our interview because I wanted to discuss the deadly sins of recruitment with you because <laughs> I, I really like that terminology. And I think that, you know, as you can imagine, when a candidate, when a client reaches out to me, they're usually frustrated with how their job search is going. They usually have either tried to um, job hunt by themselves and and didn't have, you know, a good run or they are avoiding it 
when they're procrastinating. But if they have tried, they have bumped into bottlenecks along the way. They feel they've been ghosted. They feel like they've gone through, you know, uh, rounds and rounds and rounds of interviews that led to not much at all happening. And they, you know, want to work with a coach to identify how to advance in those processes with less stress and feeling less overwhelmed by it. Um, so I was wondering if you could share with us, maybe not all 10 deadly hiring scenes, but Give maybe. Me one. I don't remember that article, so I don't remember. <laughs> was that my article? It, um, it, it was a, um, an article from ages ago, the 10 deadly hiring scene, sins that, that people have during well, uh, job, you know, the recruitment of well, candidates. The article that I kind of remember for candidates was called 15 Ways to Hack a Job. So if you look up oh. on LinkedIn, hack a job. It might okay. be related to those two. I just don't recall the other one. Uh, but the one that I, I give, the advice I give to Canada, I'm going to give a story from about 10 years ago. Okay. It was very similar. The young fellow, I guess, who's young, but I don't really know that. He was getting his master's degree in marketing research or something, and he was Italian. Uh, and he calls me up and he had a pretty strong accent, but I understood it. And he said, I want to get a job in the big telecommunic in a big one of the big telecommunication companies in Europe. And Siemens was one of them. And I don't remember the name of German one, another or German Siemens was German. I can't remember the other name. Mm -hmm. And I, he, I said, what kind of work do you do? And he told me, I said, why don't you do this? And he wanted to work at the VP level. So I said, mm -hmm. well, you could easily find out the names of the VP marketing of any of those companies or any of those divisions. Why don't you just pick five or 10 of them, get the VP marketing and then read their products, their product line. Uh, and look at their competition, which you can do it. You're a marketing analyst. So do a little two or three page PowerPoint or consulting study, which created a competitive analysis of their products against their competition. Yeah, you know, just a little matrix and a little story of what you could do and say, hey, I've been doing this. I'd like to work at your company and really take this project a little bit further. Uh, and then he, so about a week, two weeks later, a month later, he called, hey, Lou, I got, I sent it to five people. I got three interviews three interviews just based on, and he sent me, I, I, maybe he told me what the project was because I don't remember seeing it, but it was obviously pretty good. He said, okay, here's Siemens doing this, this company's doing this, this company, and here's their biggest system. It was a PBX or some kind of telecommunication switching system. Yes. Uh, and I had done an, some in, work in that industry, so I kind of knew the words that he was using. Um, and, he, and then he said, I got three interviews and they're coming up in the next two weeks. I lost track of the guy for about a year and a half. I looked on his resume. He works. He was working at one of the companies. But the idea was, and some people, oh, I'm not going to do consulting for free. No, do consulting for free. You're not really doing it. You're getting an interview. It's like market. It's like marketing. If you're a marketing guy, it's like marketing. Hey, here's how a competitive analysis would be. Here's what I've done so far. It would take three or four hours to do it to get a job. And you wouldn't, and you have a chance to talk to the VP marketing. Give me a break. This is kind of the coolest thing in the world. And so if you complain that you're giving consulting away for free, you're not going to get the job. Yeah, you know, it's not the mm -hmm. kind of people I want to work for uh, or I want to play. So, I mean, even the fact that somebody would say, I'm not going to give consulting away for free, I'd say, you know, give consulting away for free because you're going to get a full time job and you won't be paid for free. So, uh, to me, it's kind of like, hey, this is what marketing people do all the time. And in many ways, getting a job is very akin to marketing yes. and very akin to sales. Yes, if you're not absolutely. a good marketing person or a good salesperson, to get a job, you have to be a good marketing person, a good salesperson. Being a good marketing person gets you the uh, the chance to make a presentation. Being a good salesperson gives you a chance to close the deal. And the way you close yeah. the deal is, hey, you know, uh, I really appreciate having the opportunity to interview. Why don't you walk me through some of your challenges? I'd like to give you examples of work that I've done to relate it if that's close. And we'll see if uh, I'm competent and motivated to do this work. I mean, so if you think about marketing and sales as a way to get a job, uh, it's a total, it's what you have to do to uh, to get there. So I don't know if that's probably one of the ways to hack a job, but it's uh, there's, there's a lot, probably other stories related to that, that I, uh, if you read between the lines, you'll see other opportunities to get work. I love that story, Lou, because... First of all, what you've just said about marketing is so true. And, and ironically, so many of my clients have a comms background or a marketing or sales background. So some of them are listening. If, if you're listening, you know who you are. Um, but, but, you know, applying that to your own career is a different story. But once you understand that it's needed, then they have the the um, 
sort of the tools, the career tools are already there for them. Whereas when I have a client, let's say with a finance background, they may not have the marketing tools, but they have the discipline and the consistency and, the, you know, that routine of taking up a new project that is so important. And that's the other thing that you've mentioned as well with your um, example is the idea that to, to hack a job, you have to, to also carve out the time to do the work <laughs> you need to sort of understand yeah, that as a project the one thing you should never do is apply to a job posting that is the biggest mm. waste of time in the world mm. job postings are useless unless you're a perfect fit do not apply but you can use oh wow that that's a big post. statement oh it's, it's a true statement yeah. well, i mean i was at and this had to be 2018 or 2017 now i think i'm actually thinking it had to be 2020 it was the last flight I had business trip was at a big applicant tracking system uh, convention with all their customers. And uh, the, the CEO of the company said, our, our system has uh, handled 60 million job postings in the past five years. So this was they handled, they managed them. It's called an applicant tracking system. Mm -hmm. And he said, and based on that, 600,000 people got jobs and they all clapped. And I'm sitting in a room. I said, why would anybody clap? It's 1%. So, but they, a lot of, this is where I talk about it. It's too easy to apply to a job. It's a waste of time. Only a 1%, there's only a 3% chance you'll get interviewed and a 1% chance you'll get hired. So why bother? I mean, to me, the biggest, if you're going to save time is don't do it. On the other hand, you see a job posting for a engineer or a director of accounting or a cost man, whatever the job is, use that as a lead. Oh, mm -hmm. this company is hiring a cost person. Or this company's hiring a marketing analyst. Or this company's hiring a director of logistics. Well, don't apply to the job. If I'm, they're hiring a director of logistics and you've got background in logistics, find out. You can go on LinkedIn and instantly find out who the vice president of logistics and supply chain is. And then say, hey, I understand. And then also might want to look for other jobs that that same company is doing. Oh, they're hiring a director of logistics. And... They're launching a couple of new products and they're expanding their manufacturing operations. Well, now you know that they're investing money in a new product line uh, and they're going to be from procurement in Asia and procurement, whatever it may be. You have a lot of research. Now write a little story and maybe even put a little video together. Hey, I've done work. I under, I'm looking at what the work you've done. I see you're launching a new product. I have some background in that. Here's a two minute video. I'd love to come in and chat with you. Or you hack a job that way. But you can use that lead as or that job posting as a lead for another job rather than applying. Applying is the worst thing you can possibly do. Let me tell you, if you're mm -hmm. do not apply, you will not get a good job uh, and you'll not get paid enough. It'll be a dumb decision. And I think, and if you think that applying for a job is a way to get one and you uh, are so proud that you applied to a hundred jobs, no, you've wasted a, uh, wasted a lot of paper and wasted a lot of overhead um, and waste a lot of people's time by applying, including more importantly, you will not get a good job as a result of it. So I say, hey, getting a job as sales and more. Do you think you think salespeople go out and uh, oh, this company wants to buy a new system? Oh, I'll just send them my uh, summary and they'll buy my product from me. No, it doesn't happen that way. Uh, if you want a good job, you're going to have to work for it. But if you spend your if you narrow your focus to five or ten situations and work hard on five or 10 deals with five or 10 companies, something's going to, it's going to pay off in the future. Lou, um, do you also think, you know, what's your view on passive recruitment of candidates? Do you think that those jobs that are advertised are in fact filled uh, or, you know, considered and shortlisted via passive recruitment? by recruiters oh, contacting. Yeah, I, I, I have my, a feeling that a lot of the, the, the short listing now is done by passive recruitment instead well, there of is direct hidden, applications. Well, there is a hidden job market. Mm -hmm. That job posting went up because company that they legally had to post it. But in mm -hmm. parallel, they're also looking for their network or other people they know who might get it. Uh, yeah. And if they had somebody, they, they probably would have filled it right away. So by the time you see a posting, it's almost too late. Um, they're already interviewed. It doesn't mean it's not existing, but don't apply because it's it doesn't matter whether it's late or not. Uh, but if you if you've identified ten or twenty companies that you think are growing in your local market and you want to uh, work there, uh, start doing the research about it. Look at the job postings. Look at all the postings and something, and then start networking with. Or just talk to the VP of marketing or the director of logistics or supply chain. These people 
and recognize if if someone just gives you the resume, if someone in a company gives you the resume, even if they don't know you, you're put on the top of the list right away. If you mm-hmm. apply, you're at the bottom of the list. So getting to the top of the list is uh, takes some work, takes a little bit of leads. But yeah, is it a yeah. passive market? Is that I don't know if it's passive, but it's uh, there's certainly candidates who are known to the hiring manager who are the first choice, mm-hmm. and only because there's a less risk to the hiring manager to hire someone he or she's worked with uh, versus someone who's a stranger. Same thing with a candidate. Hey, you're a stranger. It's you got a lot of issues here when you start in a job. It's a risk for you too as a candidate. Uh, and that's why I, I tell hiring managers, spend more time with fewer people. Convert mm-hmm. strangers to acquaintances before they become employees. Um, and that it goes both sides of the uh, the desk in that, in that issue. So you can yeah. tell I'm pretty... Uh, uh, opinionated with respect to how all this should be done. <laughs> oh, I knew that already. <laughs> so I'm glad that you're here um, telling us, you know, exactly as it is. Lou, one thing that you mentioned before was, a, you know, not with these words, but you you mentioned age, you know, as one of the elephants in the room that can show up in, in career progression. And ageism is something that I deal with, with, you know, clients as well. And, you know, you... Um, have such an amazing sort of business and career and, you know, you're still going strong. When I grow up, I want to be like you. So I want you to teach me the secret sauce. What's the secret to carrying on and working and having that longevity and uh, recognized expertise um, throughout your career? Yeah, I don't know that there's a secret. Again, it's kind of like in some way I fell into this. Um, become a recruiter. No one would ever have thought that I could become a recruiter. My early background was an engineer. I was actually working on a nuclear missile project when I was 22. I wow. went to blow up a nuclear missile when it was off course. Uh, I then got into finance and accounting and I, with these companies said, you know, we could actually, we could produce these missiles more accurately if we did this and this. And then I kind of got a master's degree in finance and accounting. Then I got into manufacturing and then I quit because I didn't like the boss and I became a recruiter, but I also could see how that business process applied. And I made quite a bit of money as a recruiter. So I didn't, once I made enough money, I said, I don't care about the money that much. And now very few people could make that statement. I kind of lucked out that I believe that my wife supported it, but nobody would feel sorry for me. I don't live in a, I do live in by the beach. It's not that I live near the Pacific ocean, but that's so it's obviously not my house back there, but um, I live in a very delightful area, uh, Laguna beach, Southern California, and I'm feel blessed to be here. Uh, But I also enjoy the work that I do is try to understand the complexities of human nature and behavioral science and psychology and all this. So I get, jazzed about thinking of how all those pieces come together and how to articulate that in a 600 word article with a graphic. Uh, yeah. So I don't know that, and I, but I don't enjoy it full time. I work half time right now and uh, I got this new course for LinkedIn and I'm enjoying doing it, but I can do it at half time. So that's kind of fun. So I don't know that there's a secret sauce and I don't know that I could replicate what I've done here. Uh, a lot of my friends, I still keep in touch with friends from college and high school, and they're all retired or all but one of them. And uh, those that continue to work seem to be the most satisfied if they do work they kind of like to do. Um, oh, great. So I think that's probably the issue is you got to find something you like to do. And uh, if you're forceful enough to uh, take it for the right reasons, which is maybe it's a 30 percent solution. I don't know. But you got to think about the, what's what's a non-monetary impact of these jobs. And I see too many people focus on things because of what they get on the start date. Uh, and I tell candidates to think about this. In fact, I've got a hiring manager class and I talked to uh, about 30 or 40 recruiters and hiring managers. And I said to them, to get them m- the mindset of what this course is about. I said, imagine you were a candidate taking a job and you started that job six months or a year ago. And you're at some family party or some family event and your favorite uncle or your Somebody who you, a friend of yours you hadn't seen for a while says, oh, I understand you got a new job. How's that job going? And you say, great. What was the reason it was great? Mm. And I had everyone put in the chat, why is this a great job for you? And I said, well, this is, and then, then I'm back to recruiters and hire man. I said, 
this is what you have to give to the candidate whom you're going to hire that uh, six months or a year after they start, they'll say this job is great. And we're going to show you how to do that in this course. But it's also candidates have to think the same thing. Hey, think yeah. about you're in a job six or think about a job you really thought was a great job. It was a great job for you. Why was it great? Well, don't accept another job unless you know those things. And it's not the money. It's the work. It's the people. It's the team. It's the environment. It's the culture. It's the things you do every day to get you up in the morning and go to work. And if it isn't, and if you can replicate that greatness, yeah, taking five or ten percent money isn't a big deal. It's doing that work you want every day. So maybe that's the message you were looking for, Renata. I think it's close anyway. Well, it was a very selfish question. I wanted to know because I want to be like you, <laughs> working and helping clients, um, you know, for as long as I can. I really take. I think. I think what you said is you have to get a kick out of this. You know, it, it has to be something you're passionate about, and um, that really energizes you and not take energy from you, I suppose. Right. No, and that's the boss that he took energy from me. I can think of him 44 years ago when I quit. He, <laughs> sucked, he sucked me out for two days every time he showed up and oh, no. tried to put handcuffs on me. And I said, no, I'm not going to take those handcuffs. Sorry. <laughs> uh, you got to be pushy to pull that off. So yeah. I was pushy enough to make it happen. Oh, no, I think I think he did you a great favor because then you started working as a recruiter and, you know, it's it's been a, a much better recruitment world because of the advice you've, you've been giving people, Lou. So thank you so much for your time today. Like I said, I'm thrilled that I was able to interview you for the Job Hunting Podcast and to do it live is great. But, you know, in a few weeks time, we're going to edit this interview and, and have it in um in podcast um, world for a lot of a lot more people to listen to. So, you know, it's it's amazing to have you on board. Do you have any last advice before we we close well, today? I guess the only I, number one, thank you very much, Renata. The very nice, warm comments. So I appreciate that and good good questions. I'd say uh, preparation is key uh, mm. for a candidate. You got to know your strengths and weaknesses. So I tell candidates write down your strengths and weaknesses and come up with a story for each one. Uh, a good two to three minute story for each one that can prove uh, that you're analytical, that prove that you're good team skills, prove that your results focus, prove that you can deal with flexibility, go through it all and make sure you have those stories. So when someone asks you a question, Hey, can you give me an example of something? Cause I'll ask you the behavioral questions. If you can relate that to the job and a true story, you're going to do a great job in the interview. Even if the question is not as good as it could be, you can still do as great a job as you can do. And that I think is very important. So preparation is key. A hundred percent agree. And Lou, next time I'm in um, your neck of the woods, I'm going to come to Laguna Beach and we can have a, a coffee. Would that, well, you would got that a, be good, okay? I got a good Starbucks that overlooks Main Beach. I'm happy to have oh, you, meet you there. Perfect. Let's do that. Thank you very All much, right. Thank right. you, Lou. Have a good Bye. day. Bye-bye.